Hello everyone and welcome to the Frontend Engineering channel. Today is another system design video episode. We're going to look at the uh, how to build a Notion-like system. Um, so we will try to understand how can we build extendable components library that it's easy to support inside um, the custom markdown syntax. So we can easily extend our syntax to support more components. We're also going to see how can we build a Notion-like databases, basically a way to group the Notion pages and represent them as different views. For instance, we can support timeline view, a calendar view, and so on. But before we start, please consider subscribing to this channel and ringing the bell. This is the best way how can you uh, show the support to this channel. All the content here is free, so I'm very happy if you subscribe uh, for the channel. Also. Feel free to comment under this video. I try to read all the comments and usually your feedback is pretty valuable so I can improve my next videos. So yeah, let's get started. So before we jump into the design, I think it will be useful for you to understand what Notion is. So Notion is the web application that allows you to build um, custom workspaces and it uses a very advanced kind of um, self-developed markdown syntax. So basically you can create pages, each page uh, represents, uh, let's for simplicity, let's say it's the markdown page. And you can, can use multiple components. So for instance, you can use different type of heading. So I use Notion to structure my interview notes when I was preparing for my interview. So most likely you, you, were, uh, you already saw the page with all the material that I collected throughout my preparation of interview. So as you can see, uh, there are multiple components that allows you to structure the content and use different type of um, text headings uh, and so on. So also Notion has a very nice concept of the databases. It's basically the way how can you group your content. And basically um, the databases uh, is just a list of pages. So uh, which can be displayed in a different view implementation. So there's a timeline view, there's a table view um, and so on. Uh, yeah, this was a very quick overview. I don't think it will be enough. Uh, so I suggest that you can just download the Notion and try to use it to see uh, what the system is. But basically, yes, it's a very highly advanced uh, markdown system, a custom markdown syntax parser uh, that allows you to structure the pages. All right, with that in mind, let's start the design. All right, we are back to draw IO. And so before we start the si any system design, we need to have a plan. I already pre-populated the plan just for the sake of time. So, as usual, we will start with the two main things, collecting the requirements. I split the requirements into two sections. The one is the general requirements, it's the main thing that we need to do in our, um, in our application. And the second one, additional requirements, it's some advanced parts that we really want to add to this design. Then I'm also thinking that it will be useful to provide a mock-up for, um, for our application just to see how it will uh, play with a high-level components hierarchy and data flow, which is covered in points 3.1 and 3.2. Um, the fourth thing of this design uh, is the markdown parser. So we need to make sure that we design our custom markdown parser in a very extendable way so we can support um, easily support new components in the future. Um, the, f uh, the next thing is the database design. So the database design is what I show, uh, showed you before. So we need to think about this concept and how can we support multiple, how can we group the pages and support multiple views and in the future support more views. Um, the next thing is the state design. So we want to see how uh, the state is configured and how the data flows between the components. So the uh, next thing is the API design. So the Notion, although Notion is a flying first application, it's, it's still a web app, so we still have a server, we still want to save our data to the server, and we also want to fetch any uh, live updates if we want to support conflict, uh, if we want to support like collaborative editing. So we'll briefly touch uh, touched the conflict resolution. So although I'm not going to uh, dive into it, like deeply into that, because some, the conflict resolution thing is pretty complex. Many people write um, a PhD on that. So it's not uh, the part of the front-end system design, so we'll just support some live updates just in case we want to support the conflict resolution in the future. Um, then we're going to cover optimization and accessibility um, to make sure that our application is optimized for uh, multiple screens, uh, also for screen readers, and we also have the best performance that we can get as the web application. Of course, uh, so uh, now we can start the designing the things. 
So first we start with the general requirements. So for the general requirements, um, our main thing will be to, uh, to implement the custom editor that supports life element transformation. This means that we need to have experience like markdown. Uh, markdown, when you type something, it automatically converts uh, this text into the custom components. So let's type it. Second thing, we need to have extendable components library. What does it mean? We want to have, so our components library should be should be built in a way that we can extend uh, it with more components and support this component uh, in the uh, in the synth in our custom markdown syntax. So let's say uh, I'll type it now. Third thing, um, our work, Notion workspace is the hierarchy of the pages. This means that we need to, uh, to support higher, uh, page hierarchy, so the page can be inside a page. And as a general requirement, we want to make sure that our content is accessible. So next thing, uh, we're not going to uh, dive into the into deep details, but I think it's uh, worth noting that we want to focus also on the performance. Although Notion is the desktop first application, it means that most likely we will not use it uh, that much on the mobile devices. So the performance and network concern is um, less important here. I think we still want to mention that that application performance on both sides, uh, CPU and network. All right, so we collected the general requirements. What about adv uh, advanced functionality? So as I mentioned before, uh, one thing that we need to su support is the databases. So Notion database is just basically the way how can you group pages into the uh, custom views. So we want to be able to connect the pages to these views. Okay, so the, the second thing is because the Notion is offline first application, so it means that we need to support offline. But we still want to focus, uh, we, we still want to have efficient network communication because we still want to up, uh, have uh, the server uh, keep our data. So we, have to, uh, we update the page and then instead of like, for instance, sending the whole page, we can try, uh, try to calculate the difference and submit the delta. So, and as a default requirement, I think it's worth noting that uh, we want to, our application should be cross-platform. And we also want to have multi-view port support. All right, so because the Notion is basically a web application, we get our cross-platform support. So for the multi-view port, yes, we need to focus more on supporting different viewports. Uh, basically, it's on the component design level. All right, I think we have our general and the advanced functionality requirements done. Let's focus on the mockup now. For the sake of time, I'm going to copy uh, the mockup I prepared for this uh, design. So on the real interview, most likely you don't need to draw it. But I think for educational purposes, it will be useful for us to see what we're trying to build. So as you can see, um, the notion itself um, consists of the uh, two main sections. On the left, you have the workplace hierarchy that represents how your pages are structured. And in the center, you have your content area where you can add uh, components, uh, make any edits and so on. So this is just a UI mockup, but it doesn't give us the idea how the system will work on the high level. So I suggest that we draw the schema of high level components architecture that which we can use to dive deeper into a certain specific part of the system. Um, so how do we start like uh, building the schema? So every application needs to start somewhere. So and I think the application route is the logical start. Um, let's start with that one. All right. So the application route is where the journey of the user begins. So this component receives the uh, root page ID. So you will ask me where do we get the root page ID. So I'm assuming that there is some global state that somehow will get the data of the page and we'll cover the, uh, this in a second. Um, how do we get there? But let's assume that we have this uh, root page information and it goes right into the application root. So let me write the root page ID. So since we know the ID of the root page, we can construct the hierarchy of the workspace. So we basically can add each page so the root page can have multiple children and based on that we can construct the menu. Okay. So 
I think the single page application in our case will uh, will will be one of the like the best approach uh, to consider in terms of our architecture standpoint. So every sync uh, because when you select the content on the left, uh, then you immediately get, immediately get rendered the content in the center. This means that we need to have some kind of the application router. Okay, so now we have our application router and the application menu. So within the applica the application router receives the page ID. So it might be not the, uh, the root page already because uh, we need to, we're basically rendering the page that we're selected. So once we receive the page ID, we can now the render the page route. So page route also takes the page ID. And the next step is to render the page content. So page content is basically the content of the page that we're fetching. Um, before we can uh, show any components uh, within the page content, we need somehow to parse the raw content. This means that the page content uh, goes for some processing, and we call this processing. Um, so, and I'll call this thing lexer parser render. So, what is that? So, the lexer will take the raw content from the page and will try to tokenize that into understandable objects. Uh, we'll pass this data to the parser that will take this JSON object, will try to connect these components with the global state, and then um, connect the render function, that represent, uh, which should uh, should render the output, the HTML element for the specific component. Uh, for now, we just uh, make it as a square. We'll focus on this part just in a few minutes. So let's assume we have implementation on this thing. So the page content um, goes to, to this thing. And basically, we have here we have raw string content. All right. So the content itself can be split into the two parts. Uh, one is the active area that the user edits, and let's see the example within the Notion actually. So here uh, we have when we select row, the content becomes editable. So basically, we set the attribute content editable to the selected node, so we can place any uh, type any content within this node. So there's no hidden input inside that Notion uses. Um, basically, uh, this attribute allows to use any HTML container and type any random information inside. There are downside, uh, drawbacks of that. Now, one of the drawbacks is that we will not be able to um, try, uh, use any standard uh, input events, for instance, on change, on glee, uh, or for instance, on, on change event. Uh, so we need another way to track the changes. So let's split our content uh, into the two parts. One is the static area and selected area. Why do we want to split this one? So when the area is static, it means we don't really track any changes here. So it's we render it once and we'll be able to cache this area. Uh, every time we want to re-render the page, this area should not be changed. The ch uh, we need to track the changes only on limited selected area here. And as I said, how do we track the changes within the uh, content editable, editable HTML node? So for that purpose, there is a special API called Mutation Observer. So Mutation Observer will allow us to track any DOM modifications within the node. All right. And once we change any content of the DOM node, we will need to update the global state. OK, so here uh, we pass the raw content string and here we pass the changed string. So how do we update the global state? To update the global state, we need to have some kind of uh, dispatching system and the actions. So I'm going to use uh, event-based architecture. If you're familiar with Redux, most likely you saw that and you used that already in your uh, practical experience. Uh, but for, for those who doesn't know, so we'll use a global dispatcher. So basically it's the thing that will be, it's, a, it's the part of the system that will be available on any level of the application that will allow us to, tri uh, to trigger certain application actions. Um, so action represent um, a, simple, uh, a simple event uh, that application needs to react to. Each action leads to the global state update. So we need to have action handler that will take this action and will update the global and generate the uh, global state. If you're familiar with Redux, um, any other like state management framework, uh, which, which I have event based. So, uh, you know the concept of reducer. Basically, reducer takes an action and then generates a new state. Here we simplify things a bit. Um, so we, we have our global action handler. So once we change the content, mutation observer will 
uh, send an action to update the global state uh, state the content of the page. So let's say we have update content. The the action handler will generate the new st uh, the new state for application. So actually, I made a mistake here. First, we need to send this thing to dispatcher, and then the dispatcher will send it to action handler, and the action handler will generate the new state for us. So the state is updated, and the string uh, the cycle repeats. We go through the page ID, then we the lexer parser and render will get the new updated string content. So it will be able to render uh, the, the component that we are selected. So to demonstrate that, here we have our area, and for instance, I type um, double box, and once I press space, uh, the content is updated. Okay, so here is our high-level structure of uh, how we're going to work with uh, with the data within the application. It's it represents a very high-level schema and data flow, but it helps us to understand how the data flows within the application. And now, as, uh, when we have the clear picture of how this will work, we can jump into the understanding what are the types of components that we have in this, within the system. So we want to provide a common interface for different types of components. And now we are ready to focus on the lexer, parser, and the renderer. All right, let's draft the components that we want to support. If we look at the Notion, we will see that uh, there are several types of components that we can use within the system. Uh, ones are text elements, basically h1, h2, h3, and p, that will allow us to structure the text content. And there are structural container elements, the elements that helps us to structure all elements within. So it's basically um, components that can accept any other components as a children. Uh, the next major part is database elements. The database elements um, basically represents the custom view of the group of pages. So we can group multiple pages into the one uh, uh, Oh, into the one view, for instance, it can be table, um, calendar, or timeline. So you can see there is some kind of a pattern that we can see. Um, first of all, um, I think we can split these components into the, as I said, into the three types. Let's think about it. So the first type will be visual. So visual components are will be just uh, simple functional components. They take the data and renders it. Um, these components uh, will not have any structural properties, so they, we will not allow to set any custom children there. Um, unlike the, the structural components, the key difference for the structural components is that structural components are, will accept any uh, other components as their children. So this type of components will help us to structure our page. And the last um, type of the, uh, of the component is database connectable. So, uh, this component is kind of advanced at structural components because they will allow us to structure the pages that we have. So basically, it's a component that takes pages as a children and will help us to represent the pages um, with, uh, with a custom view. For instance, if it can be table, calendar, or timeline. With that in mind, we can assume that uh, all components will have kind of similar interface. Uh, so if we want to extend the, the component library, we first determine the type of the component. And then based on the type, uh, we can easily use the same interface uh, and all components will be similar in that sense. This will help us to extend the library in the future. With that in mind, I think we're ready to start prototyping uh, the custom markdown and lexer. So let's jump into that. Okay, so now we're ready to design our lexer. As I said before, the markdown syntax that we're trying to parse will come from the two sources. One is the life area and the second one is the static area. So why do we split this into the two parts? Because probably the life area is the part that we will not be able to cache while we do the re-rendering cycle. So, and the static area is the area we already parsed, so we don't really need to generate any um, additional HTML elements. So most likely we'll be able to use the cache here. So all the tokens that were processed before, they will be already generated, so we don't really need to re-render that part. That's why we split this into the two parts. So both of this area will use the uh, kind of custom markdown syntax that we uh, we define. And so to understand how this is going to be parsed, we need to define the lexer interface first. So let's try to write some basic interface that we um, uh, that we can use. Uh, so I think uh, I'll for this one I'll use the code image. So for instance, uh, let's define the lexer interface. So I'll use TypeScript notation for that. It will have the single method called process, and it will accept two arguments. The first one is the rules, 
and um, the, it will be the array of the defined rules within the system. The second arm argument will be the, con the string content. So the idea of the lexer that it should return parsed array of component tokens. So the component token is the object representation of the parsed content. So it basically thing that it's easy to read in order to process uh, for rendering. So let's do the screenshot of this thing. Okay, and now we can insert this inside uh, Joyo. So this will be the interface of the lexer. Now we need to understand what actually what the, what is the interface of the rule. So within our system, we can have multiple. Uh, or we can have multiple rules. Basically, the rule defines how the component is parsed. So we can have a specific rule for each one, uh, for each two, for the table rule. Uh, the, the rule representation can be different, so you can define some set of the number of uh, regular expressions to parse this thing, um, and so on. So let's define this the interface for the uh, or the type uh, for the rule. So how the rule is uh, executed. So for this one, I'll also use the code image. So let's create this out and define the interfa interface for the rule. So the rule ha will ha the rule object will have two methods. One is is valid. So basically, this method will take the line of the string, and the idea of this method will be to return um, a boolean that will tell us uh, whether this string is valid or not for this specific rule. So, for instance, if we see the um, h1, uh, if uh, rule for h1 uh, confirms, then we'll, we'll be able to call the second method, which is called get token, and the idea of this will be to parse this uh, expression and extract all the attributes uh, from uh, from this line of code. And it should return uh, a component token. So a component token is the object representation of a uh, parsed string. So it basically has all the attributes that we need to set for the component that we can we are ready to, to pass to the parser to generate HTML element. So this will be our interface for the rule. Let's also make a screenshot here. Okay, so now we have interface for the rule. And as I said, the rule uses the component token. So this part is missing at the moment, so we don't know um, how the component token is represented. And remember, we discussed that we have different type of components. Well, the component can be st visual, structural, and database component. So let's try to define um, the possible generic interface for three uh, component types. So we are back to uh, code image. Let's define the interface for the component token. So I'm using the type notation. And I'll use the generic uh, parameter that um, we call component props. So because we we might have uh, multiple comp uh, components within the system, so each component will have a different type of a different set of props. So that's why we basically use the generic here to identify the type of the uh, of the property model. So these attributes will use this generic interface. And that's it. That's basically the skeleton of the uh, basic component uh, component token. But remember, we said that we have also multiple type of component tokens. The first one is the container, basically the component that may accept other components as children. So let's define this one too. Okay, so um, let's call it container component token, and it will also accept a component props as a generic attribute, and we'll use this uh, component token. Uh, and we'll tr so we will basically extend the component token interface here, and uh, let's say like that. So the attributes will appear inside this um, uh, type two. So the next property is the children, because this component may accept other components um, as a children properties. And the children uh, attribute and the children attribute will represent a component token list. So it will be just an array of component token. And the component token basically may... Um, so, because we have a list of different component tokens, so we don't know the property model, so we'll have some kind of union type that uh, will contain all possible uh, component token attribute models. Okay, so now we have our container component token, and the third one is the database component. So, as we said before, database component token will represent um, a component that may accept uh, out of the basically pages as the um, as a children but because the database component is structured a bit differently so uh, let's just keep it uh, more simple before we dive into that uh, into that concept so I'll just copy over the following structure so let's assume that it will also have some attributes model and it will also may have some uh, da database data 
So we will not define the database attributes until we jump into the uh, into explanation how the database works. Let's assume uh, this will contain the properties of the certain database type. So I think we're ready to do this quick screenshot here and go back to Trio. So let's do that and let's insert this component token and link uh, the rule set that uses the component token. So you may also ask how the syntax may look like in the markdown. So uh, we don't really need to write any regular expressions, but we can define a simple syntax spec that will represent the components and how they will be parsed. So for instance, I can use the following simple table, so which will basically contain some um, syntax specification. For instance, if you use if you want to use h1, then you just provide. Uh, and to my shame, I forgot how this symbol called in English. Uh, and if you want to use the accordion, then you use the uh, the following uh, string pattern. And if it's a checkbox, then you use the double squ uh, the square brackets. So uh, we can extend the syntax pack as much as we want with, uh, with the new components. So this will be our source of the regular expressions and rules. So see, now we can easily extend uh, any like uh, the, the rule set that we use within the uh, with, uh, within the system. So if we want to add, to add more one more component, we simply add a new rule and uh, the rule will be run on the single content of the string. So we may have a situation where we have like 500 rules, but um, it will not be a performance concern until we the rule set is very, very big. So for now, I assume that we the number of components is limited. That's why running the rule set on the single line of the string is not um, that expensive. So the, for the, uh, the next item, uh, let's define a parser. So the parser will take the component tokens that we generated um, and we'll try to match these component tokens uh, with the uh, appropriate HTML uh, rendering function. So let's assume that we have the parser. And the key feature of the parser is that the parser will have access to the global state. So with that, uh, with that, the parser will be able to set the data to our components, so uh, it will be able to render the content. So basically, the parser will be responsible for the data layer. Uh, it's kind of invisible uh, controller that sets all the data and connects all the components um, within the system. Okay, so now we have the global state, and let's define the interface for the parser. How the parser will uh, take the com um, take the component token and generate the element. So let's go back to the code image now, and we'll define the interface of the parser. Okay, so it will also have the single method called process, and it will take the token of the um, of the component, and it it will generate the single HTML element. And that's it. This the basic. This is the basic interface of the parser. Of course, this parser will be called recursively because the token may contain other children. So we'll uh, we'll need to run the processing for the children too. But overall, um, it's it's a pretty simple interface. So let's copy this over to Drawio now. So this how this will be our parser interface that we'll use. And how how the parser interface will um, understand what the rendering function that we have. So basically, we will have the render set. The render set is basically the map uh, that will map the component token to the specific rendering function. Um, so for instance, we can have a simple render set of um, heading and the table. So once we receive the, he uh, the heading token, then we'll just use the rendering function to generate that. So it's basically a one-to-one -one map with the components library. So in the process of adding in, uh, adding new component will be pretty straightforward. So we'll just need to, once we build a new component, we map the render function uh, with the token. So now the parser will be able to um, to take the compo component token and output the HTML element. So this is the basic structure of the lexer and the parser mechanism. Um, the Probably the, har uh, the hardest part will be uh, when, if we start to implement this, is to connect the global state with the parser and uh, be able to process all the properties uh, because there, there might be some tricky sta state management handling. So with that in mind, I think we are ready to start exploring um, the next thing, which is the database design. So let's jump into that. So to tackle the databases, we first need to understand what is what Notion database is. So and it's not like a relational database that we will try to design. Basically, any the Notion database is the 
page that can contain pages and um, can have custom um, custom view of these pages. Um, so it can be timeline, it can be calendar, it can be table. Uh, and for the page to be rendered uh, on diff in different views, we may need some have different metadata. So the main idea is that each distinct page will have some different metadata set for a specific view. So once we choose a new view, the system will add this metadata to the page, so the page can be now rendered within uh, this view. So let's let's try to understand this concept. So the database is a page, um, and it can contain multiple pages here. So it's basically one to many relation. And when we say, let's also mark that it can contain multiple pages. Okay, has multiple. So, and in order to connect the page with a specific view, we can introduce the new concept called plugin data. So basically, if we want to support the new view, we uh, we add a plugin data, a set of metadata that help us to render this page within this specific view. So let's add it. So the page may have the plugin, and um, we can now support like as many as many plugins as we want. For instance, it can be timeline, it can be can be calendar. And it can be table. Okay, so and all of this timeline, calendar, table view will will inherit the structure that we defined before here. So it will it will be of type database uh, database component. So here we have a typo. It's actually both containers, but here it should be the database component. So and they all have the similar interface, which will be the page view. This is basically the high-level structure of this extendable view, so we can add as many uh, plugins as we want and then implement the page view for, for this specific thing. So, uh, with that in mind, we can start thinking about the state and entity design, how the page uh, entity will look like, uh, and how can we add these plugins. So, and what, what is the data model that we are going to use for, for this specific case. So, for that, I'll jump into the code image again. And let's try to imagine the type of the type page. And what are the properties that we need for this page? I think the first thing that we need is the ID. It's, uh, basically the unique ID of the page that we receive from the database, from the server. The second property is a title. So every page may have a title, which is perfectly fine, and the content. So the content is optional because the content can be just empty page. Uh, that's why we set it optional. So also, now Notion pages have an icon of for every page near the title so it's a relatively optional one so but let's uh, let's define it and each page can have children so basically the page can have a uh, array of pages within and we also can have another property called hash this will be our internal property that we can use for the rendering so once we render the content we set the hash uh, we set the um, page hash, so this will help us to understand if we need to render uh, re-render the specific uh, static area if the page was changed before. And then uh, we have the plugins. So plugins is the basically the set of uh, metadata objects uh, that we add when a specific page is rendered within custom view. So for instance, we can define a table plugin and it will contain the data that we need to render the table plugin. Let's call it table plugin data. Okay, and also we need a calendar. So it will also be like calendar plugin data. And the next thing is the timeline. So we need their timeline plugin. All right, so now we have the page structure. So let's define as a next step um, how the plugin data may look like. So for the timelines, so first let's start with the timeline. So for the timeline to work, uh, to represent the page within the timeline, we probably need two properties. Start, so which will be the timestamp uh, of type number, and we have the end. Okay. Se uh, the second plugin is the calendar. So let's define it type calendar plugin and uh, for the calendar plugin the minimal set of data that we need is just the time step of the current date so we can re uh, we can set the page with uh, on a specific date and the type table so for the table we may have a limited number of columns so each page can have um, multiple columns that we want to display um, okay 
uh, this is the minimal set of the data that we uh, that we need to represent the page within the uh, custom view. Let's copy this over, but um, but before that, let's also think about our state model. So I think the most uh, the best way to design a state is provide the really minimal state for this case. So for the application state, I would imagine having a very simple one. So for instance, it can be the ID of the root page. And then we can have a flattened, uh, the normalized objects of the pages. So basically, why do we need to use normalized objects? We have, we may have like hundreds of pages within a workspace, and we need to have O1 access to every page. So by having the simple, by having the ID of the page, we may get uh, the the page data immediately. And it's also very easy to um, set the new pages. For instance, the server may give us a live update with a new page. So and we can do, and we can just simply set the page ID to uh, to our map like structure and easily update the whole thing. So besides the convenience, it's also uh, solving our performance concern. So let's copy over this uh, code structure to our Joio. And let's call it uh, state and entity design. Okay, what about um, API design? So now we have the page structure, we define what database uh, would look like and what the um, object model that we have. I think it's start to, st to start thinking about the API design. And let's create another section within the our board. So we call it API design. So we have multiple options how can we define the API. And of course, because Notion is the uh, kind of uh, offline first application, we still need to think about how we will get the server live updates. How can we save the data on our server when we have internet connection? So let's start thinking about options that we have. And we can also split these options by the protocol available to us. So, for instance, uh, the HTTP 1 uh, and HTTP 2 have different options to implement things. For So, HTTP 2 will, or HTTP 1 will give us the WebSockets. So, because WebSockets are not supported within uh, HTTP 2. So, but when we say the WebSockets for the Notion, I think it will be overhead in terms of the complexity. Uh, because the WebSockets is very complex to support, implement, and scale. And there are multiple issues, and we don't really need the performance that WebSockets provide because mostly our uh, so our application will be uh, offline first, and the functionality that we need is just like saving the data to the server. So there is no like real time communication, maybe except collaborative editing. But collaborative editing is um, not a part of this design, and but we also support this by uh, using the HTTP two via the server side events. So let's park this. Uh, topic aside and no di don't dive into that. So we'll focus on HTTP2 options. So first option, of course, is the classic REST architecture. So what are the advantages of the classic REST architecture? So the first thing is it's relatively simple. So you, in terms of implementation, um, there are, so it's really easy to uh, to add a new interface and so on. Uh, there, there, are, there are many benefits of using the classic REST because you get you get many features of the HTTP2 such as uh, caching, uh, um, parallel connections, and so on. The HTTP1 has limitation of five parallel connections. When you use HTTP2, you may send uh, 200, uh, so you may use uh, two, 200 requests within one connection, which is uh, pretty cool. So the, although there are disadvantages of using the classic REST architecture. The first disadvantage is um, it takes a good time to design a very good production one REST API. And it's really hard to change this REST API once you release it, if assuming that re this REST API can be used by um, other like parties. So you want to expose your REST API to externals. Um, and once you need to add more entities and you want to support some kind of variations of uh, return type, then you may need to kind of implement uh, workarounds. For instance, you can uh, have the query params that will define what are the type of fields you need to return. So I think uh, in some cases REST is good. So, but I would prefer a kind of a different option in, in, in this sense. So the alternative option for that is uh, the GraphQL. So the I wouldn't say that the GraphQL is the best option here. It's basically the same um, approach that the REST using. So, but we have this, uh, we have, and it has also its own disadvantages. For instance, GraphQL 
always use the post request, so the get request will not be available to, uh, to us. We also need some additional GraphQL client that will manage the state and will be able, uh, will be responsible to syncing this server state with the client state. So we can we have our additional point of failure within the system. So although there are multiple uh, pros that we're getting with the GraphQL, first of all, this it, it's just a single endpoint that rules all the entities. It's super versatile. You can fetch any type of combination of fields, and it's ver it's relatively easier to maintain long term and. Usually, if you design your application in a way that your GraphQL entities are similar to the state model entity, then you simplify your life very easy because you can reuse the server and the client entities in this sense. So I, I would add this um, here as the... But um, I think the main advantage here is the GraphQL is super versatile. So we can return any set of fields that we want uh, without any uh, without any uh, kind of workaround solutions with the query parameters like, like classic REST. Performance-wise, um, so GraphQL adds its toll uh, by having the post request, so we are kind of losing our default HTTP2 caching that we could use in a classic REST. But I think the because the GraphQL is more convenient in this sense, I would go with the GraphQL approach. So um, what are the APIs that we need to support within our system? I think that uh, the first one is the getting the page, the second one is updating the page, and the third one is subscribing for changes if we want to support live updates. So let's copy this over and let's try to define the kind of the uh, inter uh, function interface for each of this uh, method. So for a get page, uh, we'll use a very simple uh, uh, a very simple method that's called get page. Basically, it just uses the ID uh, ID of the page uh, which we want to get, and we also need to pass the API token. So I, uh, I'm using the API token here because we always need kind of authorization within the system, and we're not covering the authorization part. So let's assume we'll use the our token to access the our server API, and this get page will return the page. And because we're using the GraphQL, we can return any set of the pages uh, on any level, uh, any set of fields of the page entity. So the second field is uh, update page. So update page, it takes the ID of the string, the delta of the previous page and API token. Why do we send the delta? So because the page can be relatively big, so we don't really want to send over the whole uh, content uh, all the time when we type things. So we kind of want to minimize that and uh, create a delta that's similar to the what the GitHub mechanism uses. Of course, we need some kind of external library to create a delta uh, and, and submit, is submitted to the server. Uh, so I'm assuming that we'll have this library that will give us the delta between previous content and the new content. So we don't we really save the traffic here. So the third method is subscription. So if I want to implement a live collaboration ed editing, so within your workspace, you have a few users that also edit in the page, then we need to implement live events. So the live events can be implemented for the server side events. So server side events are provided by the HTTP2, so we can um, subscribe for the server side events. And uh, the GraphQL provides a very nice concept called subscription. So the subscription can be implemented based on the server side. Subscription is just the interface, and we can use any implementation. So we can even use the long polling in this sense. Uh, but I think the server side events, you know, because we don't really need uh, long polling provides bidirectional connection. And the server side events is just one directional, so you get updates from the server. I think for our specific use case, um, the server side events will be very pow powerful. So we'll get the, the we'll get an updated page all the time. We subscribe um, we subscribe for that. So you'll ask how do we maintain the um, the state between the client and the server? So for this sense, um, that's why I've added the GraphQL. Because if you set up the GraphQL correctly, then the GraphQL may uh, maintain the server state and the client state in sync. So if you have any, uh, so if the server state is updated and the the page is updated, then the update can be triggered for the subscription and the client state will be automatically updated. So we kind of uh, moved the responsibility of syncing the state to the GraphQL, which might be useful when we build a kind of a large scale app. Uh, as I said before, it adds uh, its own toll as an additional um, point of failure, but I think it's very useful uh, when we want to build a kind of larger, uh, larger application. So I think the API part now is, uh, is covered. So the next thing that we want to think about is the optimization. So an optimization is my like favorite but boring topic because most of the things uh, will be kind of similar in that sense. So let's try to uh, cover uh, cover that part too. So I'll create a new section called optimization. 
So let's put it somewhere probably here. Okay, so uh, optimization. Uh, because for desktop usage, uh, the network part is not that uh, important now because Notion is desktop first application. And uh, for the rendering part, it's a bit harder to uh, optimize specific thing because there are so many components within the system. Let's try to generalize that. So usually I use um, network and JavaScript as a separate pillars of optimization. But in this, in this design, I think we can uh, use the same thing um, so the, basically put them under one section, network and JS. So first of all, uh, in terms of the network, the first thing that we want to do is to enable um, HTTP2 support on the server because it will help us to load initial assets that we provide. So the initial loading is important uh, because uh, it's when we set up the things within the, within the system. So we kick off the service worker that will cache all the assets that we fetch from the server and we and basically will enable us to use uh, our application within offline mode. So we can call that cache assets or offline mode. Okay. So uh, there are also some non-critical assets that can we can also uh, load uh, under like uh, pre-connect attribute for the script. So the or non-critical resources. So the preconnect will just uh, tell uh, tell the browser to load resources on the background when the main resources are loaded. Uh, so that's why we can save some network time uh, on loading some assets that we don't really need at first. Um, so we have we set up our service worker to enable um, to, to enable the offline mode. So the the second part that can optimize the first loading and I, and again the first loading is what's important here because we want the, our customers to load the application faster on the initial load. So it's the bundle. So the cool thing about the uh, bundle optimization here is because uh, mostly the notion is. Uh, no, uh, Notion is an uh, offline uh, app that uses relatively new Chrome engine, so we may assume that uh, most of the we don't need any polyfills for ES5, so we can prepare ES6 plus uh, bundle that will be reduced in terms of the size. Um, this will allow us to have the uh, optimized size for the modern browsers and use all features without much transpilation and polyfilling. And of course, we need to minify the code. So when we say uh, yes, six bundle. So we also want because we use HTTP2, um, the the approach that we want to use is to maximize the bundle splitting. So uh, the bundle splitting will allow us to fetch as many uh, as many resources in parallel as possible. So we can usually split this code into the some kind of vendor code and the components code. So the components code can be loaded lazily, dynamically, because, uh, for instance, uh, we can definitely save the time on loading the uh, on, on initial load if, for instance, we don't use all the components within the system. So, for instance, your page has only um, like heading, some tables, and you don't really need others to load other sets of components. So the components code can also be loaded dynamically. So other part is the compression, which is relatively a uh, default thing that all CDN does at the moment. So. Um, Compression, and there are multiple formats that you can you can use. Um, the most adv uh, advanced one, supported by all CD CDNs, is the Protly and Xip. So for the images that you add within the system, uh, we can advise the. Uh, of course, we need to use optimized format, which is the usually the PNG or even the WebP. So WebP is the most optimized thing that we can uh, provide within the system. So it, uh, for, a, for a GIFs, we can use WebGIF, which allows us to save the space that we'll, we use on CDN. Uh, to load any picture, so the user may try to load some 8K picture. So for, for, this, uh, for this thing, we don't want to overload the system. So that's why we can introduce kind of image optimization servers that when you load the image, first we send, uh, so we try to protest this image and then call the kind of our internal service that will give us optimized uh, image size. So we can save the space for our workspace. Uh, and it also can convert PNG to WebP and uh, enable more efficient serving. Okay, the next uh, thing is the rendering. So let's start thinking about it. So the, as I said, rendering is a lesser concern here because, uh, for instance, uh, 
we, of course, the table will may require some virtualization approach, but overall, because it's a desktop system, we may assume that some rendering optimization are not that uh, that important. But anyway, let's uh, let's just list them what we can do. So first thing first. Um, so let's split it into the CSS DOM and UX. Actually, I think UX is not that important, so let's use the user uh, parsing cache. Okay, so for the rendering, we have the so we have the CSS. First thing that we want to avoid, of course, we want to avoid refrolls and any like CSS animations. Uh, so we want to use the CSS animations to optimize the uh, how we change the things within the DOM. So if you use CSS animations, they are optimized on GPU. So we give we provide the best uh, possible frames per uh, frames per second ratio for for the user. So for CSS naming, um, CSS naming is important when it comes to the scale of the application. The more CSS classes that we have within the system, the better use some CSS naming strategy. So you can, there are multiple strategies that you, you can use. One is Beam, um, other ones uh, you can use Tailwind that tries to use their its own like uh, CSS strategy. But overall, the basically the more flattened class names you have, the faster recalculation of the DOM tree the browser does. Okay, so for in terms of the DOM optimization, one thing that we can do is to minimize the rendering. And we already said that we want to track uh, we want to track the changes within the page with the mutation observer only on selected area. So we track those changes within one area and we we try to minimize all the DOM changes to this specific area. This is how can we uh, op uh, optimize the rendering. I'm not diving into the virtualization part because there are too many components that we can that uh, can benefit from the virtualization. So we can just say that components may use virtualization such as table. But uh, the notion itself will not use the virtualization as for the content rendering. Okay, so I th so I think the parsing cache can be also added to the DOM. Um, the when I say the parsing cache is that when we process the page, uh, we already kind of we can build the internal cache of the uh, of the components that we rendered. So we don't really need to generate all the tokens again in a, for, for the page, and we can reuse the tokens and the HTML content that was generated previously. Many things can be optimized by using the library already. Uh, so for instance, React, Angular, or Vue will do many optimizations for you on this side. So, but we are assuming here that we are basically using vanilla JavaScript, vanilla JavaScript in our case. Whew, okay, so the last section is accessibility. And accessibility is a very broad topic, and the accessibility starts with every component. So you need to focus on the every component should be accessible, and depending on the use case. For instance, table has its own like uh, uh, accessibility attributes that you may use. Overall, there are like uh, uh, there are some recommendations that I use within when we build the large scale apps. So that can be applied to everything. So first of all, with uh, I suggest that uh, we use the RAM units. Because they scale, because they scale with the custom browser settings settings, so when you define the RAM, it takes uh, the browser settings of the user. Default is one RAM is equals uh, equals to sixteen pixels, but if the user changes uh, the zoom settings, the RAM unit will adjust. So we'll be able to adjust our UI uh, according to user settings. So it's also a good uh, a good thing to provide um, a set of hotkeys uh, within the system. So for the hotkeys, I think we can save the time because the uh, notion is a large app on itself. So the hotkeys can be designed uh, later. So uh, I, one thing that is important to mention is that um, notion as a large app should provide some uh, color schemas for people with different visual disabilities. Think it's a it's a good uh, to mention thing. So the fourth thing is, um, so we need to ensure that we use appropriate HTML tags because HTML is accessible by default. So we want to we want to make sure that we use for tables we use a table tag for inputs we use a correct input tag and we are not like trying to um, build everything with a uh, div uh, attribute with, with a div tag. So make sure that you comply with the semantic HTML. And of course, 
images should have alt attribute. One thing that alt attribute does, and especially with the large uh, AI models, uh, basically the AI model can understand what you see on the on the picture, and it, after generate the alt attribute. We're not covering this part, but we assume that the providing the alt attribute is a very useful thing for accessibility. So I think we're done now, and we covered. Um, so yes, we covered the requirements. We covered the components architecture, the type of components that we want to provide. We also tried to design our class uh, structure for the Markdown parser. And we also now understand how this Markdown parser will, wor will work on a high level, how the content is parsed, is updated, uh, and so on. So we also uh, reviewed the database concept and how these databases uh, would look like in a Notion. I'm not sure if Notion actually used that one because I tried to design uh, how I would do that uh, because it should be a very simple concept. Um, and if I'm not if I'm not right, uh, try to comment this out. How would you design this? We we'll also look at the state design and uh, entity model design, and we try to uh, also design the API, choose the best uh, the best strategy for API, and we also uh, reviewed the life updates concept. I think overall uh, design can be wrapped up. Uh, thanks a lot for watching this. I will try to provide uh, the diagram link in the YouTube description so you can reuse that. Uh, meanwhile, feel free to subscribe for the channel. And as I said, this is the best way of support that you can provide for the channel. So the content on the channel is always free. I'm happy to share it with you. And yeah, uh, thumbs up to the video and see you in the next episodes. Bye. Christmas trees on fire. Santa's holding the lighter. My parents are both liars, I got gifts but one